and uh, welcome one more time to our panelists. Uh, the way we have structured uh, today's discussion uh, for this meetup is we're going to have uh, Jameson talk a little bit about um, the, the, the earlier history, shall we say, of autonomous driving starting from uh, uh, as, as far back as, as he would like to go uh, all the way to, let's say, the middle years around the Darkwater Urban Challenge year 2004. So, if, um, and please, in the meanwhile, um, I would also like to note a few before we get, jump in, uh, a few housekeeping uh, points. Uh, please ask uh, questions using the Q&A button uh, that you find in, in the webinar. Um, I will try to consolidate and ask the questions. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask uh, any questions that are relevant to, the, to our presenters or anything really that's on top of your mind when it comes to our uh, this webinar will be recorded for future viewing, so please do keep that in mind. Um, a little bit about uh, ourselves, Apex AI. We are um, hosting uh, this webinar um, as a series of uh, meetups. Uh, we make production-grade software for autonomous vehicles, and we're also a founding member of the Autoware Foundation. You can find out more about us at apex.ai. Please visit our website, and while you're there, please also take a look at the course Self-Driving Cars with Ross and Autoware. Uh, which we've hosted on our website. And uh, that's all I have to say in terms of an introduction. Over to you, Jameson, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. All right, let's see. Oh. Uh, it looks like I can't share my screen until you stop sharing your screen, Sanjay. Okay. Go ahead and try now. So I have the difficult task of trying to get you through 80 years worth of history in 10 minutes. So we'll see if I can do this. Um, what I'm gonna try to do is we're gonna look at four different time periods in the last 80 years. And I'm, I do apologize for those of you coming to us from other countries. This is a very US centric history. So I have some colleagues who've done some work on Europe and Japan that I can refer you to those people if you like, but we're gonna focus on um, the United States here. Uh, 80 years and 10 minutes, I'm going to try to answer three questions from each of the four time periods I look at. First of all, how did the cars themselves navigate? How did they actually work? Uh, two, how do they interface with infrastructure? Infrastructure. What's the relationship between the vehicle and the infrastructure? And three, what, the people designing these, what were their goals? What did they want to achieve by designing automated vehicles? Uh, and just to, just to remind you, um, there have been a number of different goals of automated vehicles throughout history. I think one of the most common one is this idea of just effortless personal travel. The idea that you can simply uh, get in the car, relax, as you saw in the video just now. Maybe you smoke a cigar, maybe you drink some orange juice, uh, but uh, relaxation is a big part of it. Um, second, uh, unencumbered transportation, the idea to uh, eliminate traffic jams, to quickly get from point A to point B without any worries. Uh, it's been a huge, huge motivation. And number three is safety. I think safety has always been there, uh, but until recently, it's never been the primary purpose of an automated vehicle system. Oh, and there are two sort of sub goals that have popped up uh, at various times too. So recently, since the 90s, there have been the push for environmental benefits of automated vehicles, and that's sort of a new rationale for why we should do this. And actually, one of the things I think is underlying most of this from the very, very beginning is simply the, wouldn't it be really cool if we could just drive in a car without having to worry about it? So uh, I think that has been uh, a huge part of the dream from the very beginning is just the excitement about creating an amazing new technology. So I'm going to take you back to 1939. We are at the New York World's Fair, where the most popular exhibit is the Futurama. Uh, sponsored by General Motors and designed by a professional designer named Norman Bel The um, whole idea was to promote this uh, express motorways, what we now know as the interstate highway system, which didn't exist at the time, uh, to be able to very quickly get from uh, the cities into the countries. But uh, if, you, if you pay close attention, there is actually a small presentation of automated vehicles. And these cars are to, um, controlled in a very interesting way to me. Um, safe distance between the cars, uh, they don't go into details, but it's automatic radio control is what the voiceover tells you. And as for how do you keep the car in a straight line, 
Um, basically, the design is to create a giant slot car track. So you have curved edges where if the car starts to veer away from the center line, uh, gravity pushes it back down or else it'll fly off the track. So, uh, you know, pretty crude, but actually the fact that they were thinking about automating back then, I think is really interesting to me. And I think the goal here is really to get places fast. The goal is to make the city accessible to farmers and the beautiful nature that is needed to keep yourself happy available to city people. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll mention several times is uh, the future throughout all this period is always 20 years away. If you predict 20 years, that's far enough away that you don't have to be personally responsible for it, but close enough where it seems like it could happen in your lifetime. Uh, and so as people left this exhibit, they got a little tag that said, I have seen the future. All right, we're going to fast forward to 1956 now. Um, there isn't a World's Fair in the U.S. in the 50s, so General Motors has to invent its own. It creates a series of motoramas where it tours cars and, as you can see, dance troops around the United States to promote its vehicles. Uh, but in this, one of the major players was a series of cars called the Firebird cars. Uh, and this Firebird 2 is the one you just saw in the short film. Um, it's really, uh, I find it an incredibly funny film, so do watch the whole thing if you have a chance. The fact that they set the whole thing to music um, continues to amuse me. Uh, the basic technology, however, is that you are linking to a wire embedded in the road, and that's what keeps you going straight. And as for keeping in the right direction, um, all of that is handled uh, by centralized control. So you actually have these radio towers that you communicate with, and they're the ones that sort of take over control of your vehicle and guide you. So it's very much that the car has the ability to keep in a straight line, but it's uh, external forces, presumably government, although it doesn't explicitly ever say, uh, but some sort of centralized control directing cars from, from point A to point B and keeping them safe distance from other vehicles. And as you saw in the short clip that we just watched, for some reason it takes 30 seconds to get on the beam, in which it, during which time you have to stare at a computer rather than the road. I, I suspect this would be a pretty risky 30 seconds during that handover. All right. Um, just so you know, this was more than just a vision. General Motors is working really closely with RCA at this point in time and actually was able to demonstrate cars being guided without drivers uh, along a wire on a special General Motors test track. Um, this is just a couple years later, but this is very much along the lines of the video that you just saw. And what are the goals here? Um, as you saw in the video, a huge part of the goal is simply relaxed driving. Um, and if you catch the beginning of the video, the number one complaint was traffic jams. And so the goal is you can drive smoothly and without worrying about traffic jams at all. Um, I think they refer to it as the quote-unquote safety motorway, but I think that's about the only time you hear the word safety. So they want to remind you that it's safe, but um, that's not necessarily the number one goal. All right, we're going to the 90s now. Um, some of you may know IBHS America, now ITS America. Uh, a huge number of ways of integrating technology and electronics into vehicles and vehicle systems, of which part of it was automated highways. Um, the ICE-T, Inter Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, signed in 91, set aside, I can't remember the exact number, I think it was about $100 million to do a demonstration of a fully automated um, highway by 1997. Um, that was through the Federal Highway uh, so the Administration, and that money ended up going to General Motors, uh, and they coordinated a, uh, they headed the project, there's about five or six different companies involved in a few universities as well. And they made good on the call that they had to demonstrate by 97 with something called, they called Demo 97. Um, uh, this was my first uh, ride in an, in an automated vehicle. They embedded a magnet uh, every few feet in the roadways in a section of highway just north, actually part of um, San Diego. And the vehicles then were outfitted with a variety of controllers that could read where those magnets were, and that's how they stayed in the lane. And then you had radar to keep you at proper distance between yourself and the car in front of you. Uh, one of the major things that General Motors was excited to demonstrate at that time was something called platooning. And uh, a big benefit of the platooning was the efficiencies that you might get. Um, but also there was some safety benefits to grouping cars together, using all of their sensors to decide what was going on in the road, and then constant communi electronic communication between the vehicles 
to make sure they were keeping safe distance, but also monitoring the road around them. So if a deer jumped out in front of the first car, that information would be sent back to the cars at the back. Uh, but General Motors will let lots of different groups, including Carnegie Mellon, demonstrate their vehicles here. And this is, I think, one of the major shifts uh, in the history of automated vehicles, because Carnegie Mellon designs their vehicles very much based in their background in the Robotics Institute uh, without worrying about infrastructure. How do we design a vehicle that can be compatible with any infrastructure? And so largely robotic camera-based um, vehicles, uh, of which they made several different nav lab prototypes uh, of which the bus was available at the uh, uh, at the demo 97. So I think that was my, that might have been my second automated vehicle ride. Uh, I'm going to move on. Oh, so, so real quickly, the um, goals here uh, over and over again, and I think a big part of this was the funding from Federal Highway Administration was throughput. This was how do we get more cars on the same amount of road without having to build massive amounts of really expensive new roads. So a lot cheaper to embed magnets in a stretch of highway than to build a whole extra lane to handle increased capacity. Uh, again, safety, it was supposed to be safe, but that's not the major, major goal involved. Uh, then in 2004, we get rid of infrastructure altogether. Um, the first uh, grand challenge from DARPA is set up in order to uh, well, I'm going to let I'm going to let Jan talk a lot more about this, but uh, at this point, we have just given up on trying to make infrastructure do anything, and we want everything in the vehicle, which I think is a really, really important shift in philosophy. So, just a few things, uh, just to sum up, uh, a few things from history that we seem to be moving away from, which I think is interesting to reflect on. Um, now, I think by and large, the number one stated goal, at least publicly, for most people, is that this will make the world safer. Uh, that's never really been a major point of the rhetoric in automated highways prior to the 2000s. Um, centralized coordinated efforts have always been seen as key to making this happen. Government has always played a really, really big role, sometimes as orchestrating all the little moving parts, but at the very least, there's always been envisioned somebody taking control and designing the system as a whole, which is something I think that we're less focused on now. Um, physical infrastructure design has always been seen as, as crucial. It is very, very important, as well as the vehicle design. And I think physical infrastructure is something we're um, thinking about, but, but not redesigning quite as uh, fast and probably for very practical and political reasons. And finally, um, coordination between vehicles has always been seen as crucial. And uh, I know that there's certainly some of that still happening today, but I think it's less pronounced than it has been throughout the history. So with that, I will leave you with Harley Earl, uh, General Motors great designer, standing in the Arizona desert, uh, not far from where I sit right now in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, looking at three prototypes. And actually, I believe Fiber 2 and 3, both of those are designed with automated vehicle equipment. So thanks, and I'm looking forward to chat more. Very cool. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jameson. That, that, was, that was really a fascinating look into uh, right from the beginning to, to about 2004. So um, I don't see any questions yet coming in from, from the audience. So audience, please, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and into the Q&A button in, in your webinar. And uh, please feel free to ask. But meanwhile, um, can, I, can I request uh, Jan or other panelists if you have any questions for, for Jameson? Sure, Jameson, uh, thanks for that overview. That was great. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, there's always been the perception that uh, autonomous vehicles are 20 years out. Um, where do you think we are today um, in 2020? Uh, well, so I have to say, I think, uh, I think the people designing these things are far more expert about this than I am. But I will tell you, I think over the years, 20 years is that good distance where if you don't achieve it, nobody yells at you but uh, 20 years is enough to still get some government funding or funding from other people in order to, uh, to, to push the project forward. But near as I can tell, um, 20 years seems to be, uh, you know, we might be fully automated with no, with no uh, manually uh, driven cars at that point. Uh, the, the rhetoric has changed dramatically just in the last five years. And I think for very good reasons. I think the number of people involved in pushing for this, the number of, uh, the amount of engineering work going into it, the amount of thought happening even at government levels is, is at a place we've never had it before. And so uh, I think we're going to be seeing some, some rapid advances. And uh, 
Uh, yeah, you don't ha you don't have to protect yourself by saying 20 years anymore. I think you can say five years now and uh, nobody's going to look at you like you're a crazy person. Thanks. Very cool. Um, that was, uh, let's see, I have I have another um, trivia question to ask uh, the audience just to get get the um, get the activity up here a little bit. Let's see. Um, next question for, for, for you folks watching. Uh, what assistance feature was invented first? And the choices are lane keeping assistance, anti-lock braking, cruise control, and stability control. I'll give a few more seconds for this poll answers to come in. All right, I'm closing the poll now. The, the, uh, the winning answer uh, is cruise control. And honestly, that, that was uh, what I would have guessed myself, but it turns out that's not the right answer. Um, I want to ask Jan, who actually told me about the right answer, to give me what that is and a little bit of history around that. Uh, yeah, the right answer is actually anti-lock braking. So anti-lock braking was uh, first patented in the late 1920s um, for aircrafts and then um, in prototypes introduced into cars and in, put in production in the, um, in the 70s, actually. Very cool. Um, now maybe a good time to um, to pick up where um, Jamie left off. And Jan, uh, if I could ask you to to take it from from the first uh, DARPA Urban Challenge or the first DARPA Challenge, and and uh, through to where we are today. Uh, and if you have some slides to present, please uh, go right ahead. Sure. Um, can you? Oh yeah, perfect. Um, just a second. So you should now be able to see my screen. Does yes. that work? Okay, sorry. Yes. Slide. Here we go. Okay, so um, Jamie covered covered the history really well until the DAPA grant challenges. And that's where I'm gonna pick up. And that was the 2004. So the 2004, um, the first grant challenge was organized. Organizer was DARPA. Um, the U.S. Department of Defense Research Agency. And the motivation for that was actually an, an act by Congress in the early 2000s uh, asking um, the Department of Defense in the U.S. to provide the technological capabilities to have at least one third of all military vehicles in the U.S. Uh, with, the ability, equipped with the ability to either operate uh, in, a, in a teleoperated way or in an automated way. And, um, the uh, Department of Defense tried with defense contractors and that really didn't go anywhere. So they then tasked uh, DARPA to organize a challenge, a competition. And the competition in 2004 was to drive a little less than 100 miles or over around 100 miles through the desert, through the Mojave Desert, really just given a, a set of GPS points through which uh, the vehicles should pass. And in between those GPS waypoints, the vehicle had to find their own um, drivable pass. Um, that was in 2004. Um, nobody succeeded in 2004. Actually, the best vehicle just drove was this Carnegie Mellon vehicle, just drove a little over seven miles uh, out of um, around 100. So uh, not very successful, uh, you could say. Then DARPA pretty much did the same thing again in 2005 where a number of vehicles came to the finish line. Uh, Stanford, um, where I teach, uh, we won 2005. Then in 2007, DARPA took it to a more urban environment. Um, and then Carnegie Mellon came in first and uh, V Stanford came in second. So in 2004, the result was actually very, very disappointing. Um, vehicles drove into, into the sand and tipped over uh, vehicles drove into into hay and bushes and perceived it to be 
an, an object and just stopped in front, even though they could simply drive over a, a small bush. The best vehicle, Carnegie Mellon, drove into a rock, so a garage size rock, uh, but had no not an, an insufficient understanding of what its environment looked like, uh, simply perceived that the vehicle is not making any progress forward. And what do you do if you're not making any progress forward? You try to accelerate more. And uh, that then led to the tire spinning. Tire spinning for a, a significant amount of time then led to a lot of heat being produced. And the, the heat actually led to the tire starting to burn. And that was, you know, the, the overall state of environment perception and situational awareness in 2004. In 2004, that was around five years after the first very simple advanced driver systems. So specifically adaptive cruise control was introduced, uh, which consists of a simple radar. So cameras were not, except for night vision, were not introduced into uh, street vehicles yet at that time. So DARPA did the same thing again, 2005. Uh, they changed the course a little bit uh, in the sense that the more difficult passengers, and then this uh, beer bottle pass in the Mojave Desert, which was the most challenging uh, section of the course, that was put to the end and not into the to the beginning. Um, so if vehicles were not to finish, they would have DARPA could have at least uh, show progress. Uh, but fortunately, a number of vehicles made it to the finish line. And uh, V Stanford then actually came in first. We passed uh, both of the Carnegie Mellon vehicles and um, won the uh, second DARPA Grand Challenge in 2005. And, uh, and that was, uh, as uh, Jamie also pointed out, a, a stationary race. So really, you had to drive through a number of waypoints, but there was no interaction with other traffic. So if one vehicle would encounter another vehicle, DARPA would stop the slower vehicle, the faster vehicle could uh, pass the slower vehicle uh, while it was just being, being in a parking mode um, and then drive on. Uh, so a completely stationary environment. That all changed in 2007. DARPA took the event to an abandoned Air Force base in, in Victorville, in just outside of Los Angeles. And um, around 100 teams uh, applied to be part of that competition. Um, 32 vehicles uh, got invited to the final event, which then took year, took place early November in Victorville. Um, there was a number of uh, pre-selection competitions, uh, qualifying events, and ultimately 11 vehicles made it into the final race, uh, which uh, took place on November 3rd in 2007. Um, Carnegie Mellon was the, the first vehicle out of the qualifying events, but they had some issues getting started due to a large jumbotron interfering with the GPS system. So uh, um, Virginia Tech started first, we uh, Stanford started second, then uh, UPenn started, um, then MIT started with a huge vehicle with an enormous amount of sensors. Uh, UCF, University of Central Florida, uh, had a vehicle in the final event, Cornell, with a very stealthy looking uh, vehicle, Oshkosh, a military contractor, uh, equipped, actually their smallest, the smallest truck in their lineup. Um, team Anyway, friends of mine from Karlsruhe University, uh, made it to the final event. And then finally, uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, uh, they had figured out that the Jumbotron was the issue. Uh, they shut down the Jumbotron and then Carnegie Mellon could start. Here's Jamie Heinemann from the Mistbusters uh, commenting the webcast. Um, what we saw there then uh, here, you can see a traffic circle that we could set to negotiate. This is the housing area of the base where they set up an urban course. We saw the first autonomous vehicle traffic jam here at this intersection where vehicles had a challenge figuring out who should go first. Uh, vehicles had to park in uh, designated parking spots. There was an off-road area, a highway area. Here's again the traffic jam. Uh, uh, DARPA hired 30 stunt drivers from Hollywood to drive uh, human-driven cars in between um, the autonomous vehicles to generate more traffic. Um, we also had the first autonomous vehicle to autonomous vehicle um, collision uh, in that event. Uh, turned out to be uh, luckily minor, so both vehicles, um, MIT and Cornell, could continue. 
the event DARPA set up a huge control center where they could uh, pause and shut down cars, which except for that one collision was necessary. Uh, we, uh, Stanford came in first, um, and Carnegie Mellon came in shortly after us, but since Carnegie Mellon started later, uh, then we did, um, yeah, Carnegie Mellon won the race, I think uh, 11 minutes uh, in front of us actually. And um, that was actually it for DARPA. So DARPA then decided that um, it was clearly shown that autonomous vehicles from a DARPA perspective could be done. And um, actually around in the time the, those 15 years were over, um, Oshkosh then actually also delivered the, the first uh, teleoperator truck. Um, to the US military. So from a DARPA perspective, that was very successful, but not only from a DARPA perspective. So in my opinion, really the DARPA Urban Challenge had uh, three distinct outcomes, which then marked the transition from academic research. Everybody thinks it's 20 years away, uh, but as Jameson pointed out, 20 years is really enough to, um, to be not necessarily held accountable for it. Um, so three distinct outcomes. First one was clearly, as you can see here, the two leading vehicles, a lot of industry attention. Um, two of the major automakers, GM and Volkswagen, sponsored the top teams. Um, Continental and Bosch, two of the two largest suppliers, sponsored Google, uh, sponsored both teams, as you can see here, and a number of other automotive uh, and technology companies uh, put a significant amount of money in. Um, furthermore, LiDAR development. So up to 2005, everything was really either camera-based or, as you can see also here on the top right, industrial LiDAR-based, so single beam uh, LiDARs um, that were really made for industrial applications. In um, uh, 2005, um, the company Velodyne, really a speaker manufacturer here in Silicon Valley, so loudspeaker manufacturer, um, started to experiment with LIDARs uh, for the DARPA uh, Grand Challenge uh, because they found that stereo vision is not really robust enough. And that then led to Velodyne receiving a DARPA grant uh, for the DARPA Urban Challenge to develop the sensor you see here now, the Velodyne HDL64. And then they just in time, a couple of weeks before the event, delivered um, sensors, uh, about a handful of sensors to the leading teams and then Almost all teams that made it into the final were at the end uh, running on uh, Velodyne LiDAR. And that really sparked uh, a LiDAR revolution. And now there's, except for one company that is very vocal about not needing LiDAR, um, now pretty much every company working on automated vehicles is using LiDAR um, 13 years later. And um, the probably most significant event, most game-changing event was Google entering automotive. So Sebastian Strand, who led the Google team in 2007, had already moved to Google to help develop Street View from Google, for Google before the DARPA Urban Challenge. And then uh, based on that initiative and the Stanford and Carnegie Mellon teams, Google started a stealthy activity about a year later that then led to what is now Waymo. Uh, so that became uh, in, an internal project in Google in 2009 and then became public end of uh, 2010 when a New York Times journalist John Markov discovered that Google is driving around on public streets with vehicles and then Google made it public and the New York Times launched an article um, same day late, um, late 2010. Um, Google then brought uh, out the second generation of vehicles. Uh, first they used Priuses, then they used as these Lexuses, as you can see here. And um, the company I worked for at the time, we also launched a, a vehicle with a, with a Velodyne LiDAR, both in Germany and in Palo Alto in 2011. And then it took off. Pretty much every company started to um, put research and R&D and development vehicles on, onto uh, both test tracks and public roads. Here you can see uh, Toyota, Nissan had a vehicle in which I drove, Audi had a vehicle, uh, Continental put a vehicle out, uh, Volvo uh, started to work on vehicles, um, Daimler uh, put a series of vehicles out. They had a very successful drive around the course, Beta Benz, so the first uh, long distance drive with an automotive vehicle. Um, uh, they drove the same, the same route with an automated vehicle um, uh, over 100 years later. 
um, Ford put out a series of vehicles, uh, even another search engine company, Baidu, uh, put vehicles out in China. Um, we built up a second generation at Bosch based on a Tesla platform. Um, Uber put out vehicles, uh, Apple first this vehicle and then an um, even more crazy looking one with a ton of uh, HDL16 Velodynes. Um, then also the first um, autonomy driven vehicle design. So up to now we had only seen retrofitted regular street vehicles. So a design firm in San Francisco put out a vision of what uh, vehicles would look like actually 20 years uh, from 2010. Um, so basically living room on wheels here. Um, the first vehicle that was actually designed as a true driverless or so steering wheel less vehicle uh, was put out by Google in um, 2014. They built a hundred of those, drove them for a couple of years, but also found that building a vehicle is actually not as simple as it sounds. It's hard. It's it's very difficult to make it robust. So later on, Google also picked up um, retrofitting uh, just regular street vehicles again. Um, Zooks put out a design for a um, uh, vehicle consisting of four identical uh, corners that were just put together. Uh, Rinspeed put out a futuristic design, Mercedes, and, and many more, even Rolls Royce and BMW. I saw some design studies. But really the only uh, vehicle that up to now uh, has driven on public streets that was designed to be a truly autonomous vehicle, that was Google's vehicle, which, were, which are retired now um, in the meantime. And that really then, because there's a lot of innovation to be done, that started uh, the startup phase where uh, one of the first companies was Navia, a French company coming out with shuttles. Um, cruise automation started to retrofit vehicles. Uh, I mentioned Zooks, uh, Newtonomy got started. And this is, these are just a couple of examples out of hundreds of companies that um, started developing here. Two companies that came out of um, the early Google Waymo employees, uh, Nuro and Aurora, um, and also we, um, Apex AI, we started in 2017. Um, here's an illustration which I started doing uh, about 10 years ago, how just using Silicon Valley as an example, how that um, startup ecosystem actually exploded. In 2007, the time of, um, of the DARPA Urban Challenge, uh, actually three entities, Stanford, uh, Bosch, and Volkswagen working on it. 2009, Bemo started. Uh, a couple of companies uh, put up activities uh, around 2013. And then in 2019, just in a radius of um, around 10 miles uh, around uh, my home and office here in Palo Alto, we now have uh, almost 100 companies working on it. And last time I counted, um, which was a year ago, 67 companies in California, almost all of them here in Silicon Valley, have permits uh, by the California DMV to test autonomous vehicles on public roads. So an, an, an incredible um, amount of resources are now um, going into development of it. And when there are a lot of startups and there's a lot of um, commercial uh, interest acquisitions happen. So that started in 2016 when GM uh, bought and made a commitment to invest 1 billion in cruise. Um, companies invested then in Velodyne, the um, company that started the LiDAR development. Uh, Uber uh, bought Otto, which you now led to an famous lawsuit uh, more recently, which was settled. Uh, Ford invested a similar amount than GM did into, into Argo AI. Intel bought Mobileye for a record setting $15.3 billion. Uh, as you can see, an, an incredible amount of money. Um, Aptiv bought Newtonomy, Aptiv, one of the largest automotive suppliers. Um, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, Amazon acquired Zooks, uh, just weeks before they ran out of money. And uh, more recently, we've been seeing a lot of partnerships. Uh, Volkswagen invested and joined the Argo AI Consortium. Uh, Aptiv and Hyundai uh, just uh, formed a JV, which recently announced its name, Motional. And uh, that now, I, I, I spent some time tracking this. I gave up more recently. As you can see here, August Friedelin in Germany is, is now tracking it. Uh, what we see now is a really a, an incredible network 
of partnerships, acquisitions, and business relationships um, between different companies all doing um, autonomous development. Now, um, and what that really shows is that now an ecosystem is forming. There are companies have realized that a uh, full stack is extremely hard, uh, time consuming, costly uh, to develop. Uh, so companies are more and more deciding, hey, we're not gonna do everything. We're gonna focus on part of the stack that we really know well and we can really develop well. And um, this way an ecosystem is forming. Obviously what's important for an ecosystem is that things uh, fit together and that really requires a unified um, architecture defined interfaces and uh, APIs. And yeah, that was my overview over the last uh, 16 years, picking up from where Jamie uh, left it in 2004. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, for, for an equally thought-provoking look into, into how we transitioned in from um, early days into an R&D phase and then uh, looks like back into a, an, an, uh, an in industry-driven phase. Um, there's one question I wanted to read out uh, from, from the audience uh, here, which is asking about, and, and this is a question for either of you, Jameson or Jan, uh, or, or both. Um, did the aviation industry influence automakers to start thinking about driverless vehicles? So I'll give a quick, quick answer from the you know, 30s, 50s, 60s. It's clear that um, vehicle design influences car makers. So there is a reason why the Firebird line of series looked like jet powered aircraft because they were trying to design them to look like jet powered aircraft. Uh, I don't know how much the um, idea of a self-driving car really gets generated from um, self-driving uh, aircraft. Um, I suspect there's some some inspiration, but I don't know that there's a huge amount of overlap, for instance, in engineering expertise or people moving from the aviation industry into the automobile industry. But um, it's just that I haven't seen it. It's not saying that it's absolutely not there. Um, yeah, I think that's exactly spot on. So from a technology perspective, what we see is a little bit of inference, for instance, the uh, uh, avionics uh, function safety no norms uh, DO 178 B and C are related to the automotive function safety norm uh, ISO 262, uh, but not not very similar. One big difference between uh, a plane, a passenger plane, and a street vehicle is that a plane, a passenger plane, costs up to uh, several hundred millions of dollars, which allows you to tackle the challenges that we are now facing in automotive, so safety and reliability. It, it allows you to tackle those challenges really with massive redundancy. So a plane um, runs on typically five computer systems, uh, which uh, often come from different manufacturers running different pieces of software that all do the same and that need to agree in order for a certain um, activity to be executed. That's simply not feasible cost-wise to put into cars. So in cars, we have to work with a single efficient, um, comparably low cost um, computer and software systems that ultimately have to achieve the same level of reliability and functional safety. So in that sense, the challenge is even harder in automotive. Right. Um, I, have, I do have a question on, on, the, on the topic of um, the cost. Um, historically, Jameson, did you, did you what did the, the public in general have an idea uh, about what a, a firebird of the future would actually cost? And, and has that changed today? Yeah, I, I mean, these are always sort of um, uh, the, you know, the visions in the 30s and the 50s and 60s and even in the 90s. It's, it's always sold as a, an amazing future. It's not sold as a, you can buy this now. So uh, my suspicion is that if anybody did talk about costs, it would go back to the normal thing like, yeah, it costs a lot right now to design it. But once we're designing thousands of them, um, you know, once Moore's law really kicks in, we can make this all significantly cheaper. So I suspect there wasn't too much dwelling on any specific cost for any of these things. 
I think the one thing where cost might come into effect is General Motors was the uh, biggest company in the world, I believe, in the 1950s when they're doing this automated highway research. And uh, they, had, they had some extra money to blow on research projects that may never pan out. So uh, I suspect that's the reason why General Motors is heavily involved in this at the time. Rather than uh, worried about things costing too much, they had the, uh, the uh, blessings of lots of money to be able to play around with. That's uh, really interesting. Um, let's see, I want to have one, one last poll and then we uh, go into our, our final section. Uh, this poll is another quiz. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a bit of a, a test, given what you've uh, just heard from Jan. And the question is, is, why was the DARPA Urban Challenge of 2007 significant? And um, you have four choices there. Um, I'm, to read out very quickly, the first choice is it, re it required autonomous driving and traffic, merging, passing, parking, and negotiating intersections. The second is it was the first time autonomous vehicles have interacted with manned and unmanned vehicles in urban environment. The third, it marked the transition from academic research to industrial development, and fourth, all of the above. I'm going to close the poll um, quickly, just because I'm seeing that um, the the winning winning choice seems to be all of the above, which which in fact is the right answer. So good good job, uh, folks who are <laughs> watching, and uh, thanks for for. Uh, for, for your enthusiasm in, in sharing your answers and your opinions. Um, there, there's another audience question I wanna ask and, uh, and with the time left in, uh, for the rest of the time left, we will, we will focus on um, the future of, of where, we, where our panelists are looking today in terms of autonomous driving. The question is, do you feel that NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, needs to move towards regulating and determining how autonomous vehicles should operate? And would it be better if they would just provide guidelines? Any, any takers? I'll give a, I'll give a quick um, answer to that. I've actually studied NHTSA quite a bit and the history of airbags and other automobile safety devices. Um, my gut says that if safety is the number one reason you design automated vehicles, there's got to be some coordination. Um, the vehicles have to, I think, I think if vehicles can talk to each other well, you are more likely to be able to avoid situations. Um, now, whether uh, the government plays that role is a good question. Whether a corporate consortium plays that role, um, I don't know that I have the answer, but I think that there does need to be some very careful centralized um, coordination in order to really, really realize the safety benefits of automated vehicles. Yeah, and in, a, in addition to this, uh, the, the hesitation comes from uh, the hesitation, NHTSA's hesitation or the DOD, DOT's hesitation to put out federal regulation in the US also comes from the fact that historically the states in the US regulate the driver. So my driver license from California, I'm, I assume Jameson is from Arizona, um, whereas the federal government um, regulates, um, regulates the vehicle. Now in automated vehicles, um, those two regulatory areas actually meld together because all of a sudden the driver uh, becomes a part of the vehicle. That's why certain states felt compelled um, five, six, seven years ago to start regulating autonomous vehicles within their state. Um, but the federal government is, uh, has, a, has a much uh, longer, more complicated, more careful, tedious rulemaking process. So the federal government, last time I had discussions with NHTSA folks, actually felt that there's not enough data yet to make a, um, a decisive decision uh, if and how to and when to regulate autonomous vehicles. And just to give you an, an historic example how that played out with uh, ESP, ESC, so electronic stability control for vehicles. That was um, invented in the 80s by Bosch and uh, Mercedes, uh, deployed into the first vehicles in the early 90s. And then it took until 
the late 90s to uh, for it to actually make be commercially successful so more and more vehicles uh, actually being equipped with esp esc and uh, then it took until the mid 2000s for regulatory authorities both in the us and in the eu and in australia to understand that there is actually a decisive safety benefit of esp and esc and then NHTSA for the US and uh, the European authorities made it mandatory for all new cars to be equipped with ESP uh, around 2012 to 2014, depending on the region. So it really took 30 years from invention to be it, uh, the technology being mandatory in um, autonomous vehicles, in, 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 in passenger vehicles. So these things typically don't happen overnight. Yeah, thanks for that, Jan. That was really interesting. And just one thing I'll add, of course, we live in a society, at least in the United States right now, where regulation is seen as by and large evil. Um, and that is a, a, a dirty word in Washington, D.C. right now. And I think that's been a major reason why the DOT has been very hesitant to move into this. And the other thing is, you know, some of the big successes, as you say, are uh, letting, letting uh, corporations make most of the major decisions, really find out what works, and then say, yeah, give it the badge of approval. Mm -hmm. And we, depending on the election on November 3rd, we might actually see a change there a little bit. Um, I had my class at Stanford analyze the uh, autonomous vehicle guidelines. So as a background for our participants, um, in the last uh, year of the Obama administration, the D NHTSA for the DOT uh, put out um, the first version of what they called autonomous vehicle guidelines. So non-binding guidelines for manufacturers in order to introduce the technology safely. That was a 132 page uh, document um, designed to be a living document and updated. The next iteration then happened under the Trump administration uh, a little over a year later in 2017. And basically what happened is the document was cut down from 132 pages to around 30 pages. Um, basically removing uh, three out of four paragraphs and then leaving one and then removing the others. So just as uh, Jameson pointed out, really regulation is seen as evil under the current administration and, and less regulation is perceived to be beneficial, whether that's actually the case or not. Very cool. Um, for the uh, since there are a large number of um, engineers in in the uh, in the audience today, I think one of the questions uh, would be about um, cost and how the cost is going. Um, now, clearly, you know the I think Jan already pointed out that you know costs are something that have been that have been very high uh, for a fully autonomous vehicle. Uh, part of that cost is software. And uh, that's interestingly enough where AutoWare uh, comes in uh, with essentially open source, which means free um, software. And uh, the question I have is, um, do you think software will continue to be free and, uh, and hardware, will hardware actually go down in cost over time? And how do you actually see this becoming a reality for, for actual practical purposes? Young, do you yeah, want to I, yeah, I can go ahead and start and then Jamie may want to add. Um, so maybe responding to the hardware question first. So yes, absolutely, that, that scales. Uh, the majority of cost in hardware is typically a development cost. So um, give you an example, when we at Bosch introduced the first driver assistance systems in, um, the, late, in the late 90s, we lost probably lost money on every single vehicle uh, just because the volume was incredibly low, a couple of thousand to a couple of 10,000 units a year and development costs uh, are and were very, very high. Um, for radar, taking that as an example, which is a main, main sensor for adaptive cruise control, um, I think Bosch published numbers, uh, just as an example, numbers will be similar for Continental and uh, Delphi and then some other manufacturers. Uh, Bosch made about a million radar sensors in the first 15 years of production combined. So from the late 90s till around 2014, then another million in 2015, then 2 million in 2016, 4 million in 2017, and so on and so on. So what you see there is a production volume uh, hockey stick curve. 
very low, long, low um, uh, uh, time to adoption. Then once adoption takes off, um, quantity scale and with quantities scaling, um, cost per unit uh, goes down to a fraction of uh, of uh, the original manufacturing price. And that's then where companies make money and when um, uh, really commercial success takes off. For software, um, that's a little different. Um, autonomous vehicles are, as, as we could see uh, in the ecosystem I showed, um, by a majority driven by software. And um, software has become extremely complex. And the value that open source can play, um, Sanjay, you mentioned the Autoware Foundation, is to ensure that software components actually fit together by establishing an architecture, by establishing common interfaces, by establishing an ecosystem. Um, and uh, open source software, in this case, Autoware, ROS, the robot operating system has played another significant role, um, can uh, bring adoption up, uh, adoption of those common interfaces up significantly. So I encourage everyone here to look at open source ecosystems, ROS and, and Autoware for components for architecture and for getting research started and for contributing back to those ecosystems. Um, thanks, John. I can't go into those details, but let me just do a sort of a historical observation. Um, you mentioned, of course, you know, the early days are when things cost a lot, which of course is why a lot of these things are rolled out on expensive luxury cars. Um, technologies like airbags are certainly falling into that category. One of the tricks though is an airbag, if you're the only one on the road with an airbag, you get full benefits of the airbag. If you're the only one on the road with an automated vehicle, you probably you maybe don't have the full benefits of having an entire fleet of vehicles around you, all automated, all able to talk to each other, all able to maximize the benefits of for everybody. Um, so there might be an issue where, uh, you know, to sell this to the public, you need to demonstrate the full benefits. And you sort of need a critical mass, I think, possibly, to really demonstrate at least some of the benefits of automated vehicles. And so this might be a little tricky thing that previous automotive technologies haven't had to deal with. For a lot of things, if you're the only one on the road, you get full benefit. But automated vehicles, you might need a, a, enough vehicles on the road. So getting over that initial hump, I think it's going to be a tricky thing for the industry. I think that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you, Jan and Jamie. Uh, we'll have time for uh, one last question, if we can make it real quick um, from the audience, which is that uh, are we as an industry being very California focused? Um, in other words, is testing incorporating other parts of uh, the, the US and other countries equally well? And how do you see that? Uh, I can I can go first. Um... Yes and no. So um, a majority of the industry started in California and then naturally you test where you're located. Uh, to, and then that is clearly at some point becoming a limiting factor. To give an example, I know from folks at Google Waymo that uh, they obviously tested in California a long time. At some point they moved to uh, Phoenix, Arizona um, and and I think Austin, Texas at some point and noticed they cannot recognize a single traffic light. Turned out traffic lights in Arizona are slightly darker. So they had to adjust their machine learning classifiers to deal with the slightly different environment, even though for us as humans, traffic light looks like a traffic light red is on top. That's actually uh, agreed in an international treaty. Um, so we, we are much more flexible there. Um, similar, simple infrastructure-based component pose a different issue. Uh, different states in the US use different paint, uh, different types of paint. Uh, that all looks like uh, a white or yellow stripe to us as humans, but the reflectivity of different types of paint is so different that they look vastly different in camera images. So yes, it's at some point, uh, you need to go and uh, expose your system to different environments and um, you will probably notice it's, it's, it won't work out of the box. And then the more testing diversity, obviously, the better to get to the required level of reliability. 
So yeah, what we need is, is more governors like um, uh, Ducey in Arizona who announced, please use my citizens as guinea pigs, drive whatever mm -hmm. you want, no regulation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing I'll just add real quickly, um, I do live in an area, uh, not in Silicon Valley, but here just north of Tempe, Arizona, where for a while we were overrun by automated vehicles. My drive to work would be more automated vehicles than non-automated vehicles at some time. Uh, and then unfortunately, Elaine Hertzberg was killed about two miles from my house, and uh, that changed things dramatically. But what I will say is that um, I think, I mean, at least the companies that I know are being pretty good to test in as a wide variety of places as possible. So Neuro, for instance, loves my neighborhood. They drive outside my house on a regular basis because my neighborhood has no sidewalks, very few stop signs, and no street lights. And uh, you know, if you, you find the challenges where you are and you, you design around uh, continuing to challenge in, in new areas and new types of locales. So, yeah. Very good. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, on that note, we need to cut it short. We're out of time. Thank you for everybody for participating. Uh, for all your questions and for those questions that we didn't have time, uh, my apologies, but uh, we have to keep this on time. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jamie Westmore and Dr. Jan Becker. I really appreciate uh, your being able to, to share your perspectives with us. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Sanjay, for the moderation. You're welcome. Thank you. Yep. Bye.